I'll start out by saying some of the things that I'm going to say might seem to contradict uh, the, the things that Dr. Genuis talked about earlier today, but the, I think the, the ideas are very complementary and they, they fit in well together. I'll, I'll cover that in some detail. I, I do not have any conflicts of interest. I do some pro bono or just some volunteer work with some of the companies I'll describe because I, I think they're, they're at least headed in the right direction. But if they fail or succeed, I, I won't make or lose a penny from it. And uh, that, that is, they inserted that slide for me. All right. So the, first of all, I'd like to say the immune system is a very, very complicated system. So in, you know, immunology has been advancing very rapidly for the last 50 years. We've learned a tremendous amount about the immune system. That being said, I think we're still sort of like grasshoppers looking at a space shuttle. Every now and then we find a new button and we do something to the button but we, we're really not sure how the overall system is, is wired up together. So that being said, we do have a lot of problems with our immune system. I, I don't really need to talk about this very much because everybody in this audience is, is well aware of that. The, 30, the, the incidence of cancer should be more like 30% lifetime. It depends on um, how you measure cancer, especially prostate cancer. The information about 43% of children currently needing medication, that is current information. So our society is in general very sick. It, it has a lot of problems as everybody in this audience knows. That, that is not recognized by everyone though. That's not recognized universally. For example, the, the epidemic of autism is not currently recognized by the National Institutes of Health. So there, there's some reasons for that. There's, there's some mafia-like activity in the scientific community that some of you may know about, uh, protecting turf and territory, things of that nature. But in general, it's well recognized that for allergic and autoimmune diseases and now for cognitive diseases associated with inflammation, there is definitely an epidemic. I want to show you this slide here just by taking a step back and asking what does the immune system do? So on your left, there's, there's a big black box there. What that is, those, those are cultured human gut epithelial cells. You can't see them because they're transparent, so no light is reflected. There's bacteria present in that culture. On the right hand side, you can see there, an actual bacterial biofilm. The only, and so the bacteria grow, they make nice colonies, they stick to the gut epithelial cells. You can see the colonies, the light reflects off. The cassettes, it's about yay big, 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters, something like that. What this is, is an artificial gut, essentially. You've got gut epithelial cells, you've got human gut bacteria that line the epithelium. In, the only key, people had tried for decades to get this to work, the only key was to add an immune molecule. It also works with mucus. You can add mucus or you can add immunoglobulin A, as, as most of you know. In, um, that immunoglobulin is produced in the gut and, in fact, helps the bacteria to grow. Um, these are some pictures that we've taken from a normal human appendix. I'll try, it's, there, there's a steep angle here on this but I think I can point right there to those tiny little speckles. So those tiny little speckles, it's an acridine orange chain, uh, stain. Those tiny little speckles represent bacteria. The, the larger to your right, the, the larger cells that are stained are the human cells from the gut. Then on the left, you can see an overall view of the, the human large intestine. The, the most prolific bacterial growth is down in the appendix. So by deductive reasoning, we figured out this is what the appendix is doing. It is a safe house for gut bacteria. We've done a lot of other studies looking at the overall biology of this and some of the clinical ramifications of missing an appendix. It seems to pan out. The, the main point here is that the immune system is more supportive of gut bacteria than it is antagonistic towards gut bacteria. And there, there's a lot of interesting things going on with human milk and how human breast milk works, but not cow milk, but human breast milk works 
to support the bacterial growth as well. So we're back to our question then, why is the immune system so overreactive? Why do we have so many problems? And as you, again, you heard a talk earlier today about the toxin burden, and we'll cover that. But first, I want to I want to mention the Industrial Revolution. So the Industrial Revolution was the, the time when the condition of the average human changed. That had never happened before in human history. And by the condition, we're talking about the presence of eventually toilets by the 1950s. Everyone had toilets and, and running drinking water, purified drinking water. Eventually, with the Food and Drug Administration, the, the food supply was cleaned up so that we were essentially clean. Um, clean is no longer the term we want to use because it doesn't apply anymore. We just published an article in the British Medical Journal. It's been 25 years now since the term hygiene hypothesis was cooked up. Um, initially, being clean meant you had a toilet and you had you know, running drinking water and you, you had a hot water heater so you could use soap. But now, having a toilet doesn't mean you're clean. Having a toilet more has to do with, do you have mold in your refrigerator? Uh, do you have mold under your, dust under your refrigerator? Those kinds of things. Everybody has a toilet. So that's, um, it, it, there's still a lot of misperceptions about this. My cab driver on the way here yesterday was talking about how, you know, washing your hands has got to be a bad thing, right? And, and we've just heard you can wash off some antimicrobial things on your hands. But in reality, if I never took a shower or never washed my hands for the rest of my life, I would smell pretty bad eventually but I would not reacquire the organisms that have been lost that my immune system needs, unless I travel to South America or, or Africa somewhere. So we, we don't like this term anymore. We, we've sort of narrowed it down. We know what's going on with uh, the ecosystem of the body. What we call it is biome depletion. And biome, by definition, it's an old biology term. It just means all of the life that is associated with an ecosystem. So you've heard the term microbiome. Well, it's a very, that's not a good term, but it's, we're stuck with it for now anyway. That, that they're talking about all of the microorganisms that are in the ecosystem of the human body. So that's the microbiome. We're talking about the biome in general here. There's a, there's a very substantial difference between those two. And the rest of the slide, I want to connect what you've been hearing about with what I'm going to talk about now. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm going to focus today mostly on what became of the hygiene hypothesis and what should clinicians be doing about it. How should you advise your patients? Because just telling them to stop washing their hands is not it, you know, especially in certain environments because we live in unprecedented crowded conditions. It's just going to cause them to get more acute infectious disease which those act as triggers for autoimmune disease and allergies, as you've seen. 